Welcome to Dr. Lottie Science with Soul, the podcast that transcends the boundaries between science and spirituality. Prepare to be uplifted, transformed, and awakened to create a path to healing your own life physically, emotionally, and spiritually by bridging the gap between science and soul. Welcome back to Dr. Lottie Science with Soul. Today's guest is Philip Carr Gom, and he is an author, a psychotherapist, trained in psychology, sophrology, and psychosynthesis psychotherapy, and lives in Sussex, England. The founder of the Sophrology Institute, he works in the emerging field of psychedelic psychotherapy with the ACER integration community, founded by Dr. Rosalind Watts. Philip runs a sleep clinic that offers online sleep therapy and is the author of more than 20 books, including Empower Your Life with Sophrology, Seek Teachings Everywhere, and The Prophecies. For more information about Philip, please visit his website, philipcargom.com. So welcome, Philip. It's such an honor to have you as a guest today. Ah, it's a pleasure to be here, Lottie. I can't, you have done so many things and you're an author of more than 20 books. Uh, you've studied so many different subjects and psychotherapy and psychology and uh, you know about magic, you know about so many, many things. But let's start by talking about your latest book, The Gift of the Night. Can you tell us what that is all about? Yes. Well, okay. So, it, you know, my big interest has been how we can combine psychology and science with the spiritual, a spiritual understanding, a magical understanding of life. And um, I, uh, of the many things I see, one of the main features of that is, is, of course, an exploration of consciousness, this extraordinary phenomenon that we all experience. And um, my wife, when she was going through the menopause, uh, experienced really bad insomnia really affected her sleep. And she told me later that I apparently wasn't very um, sympathetic, uh, which which I was devastated. I thought I was being very sympathetic, but apparently I wasn't sympathetic enough. And, and um, I then experienced insomnia myself. It was as if the God said, okay, let's let you, you try this, see how you feel about it. So I had a period of insomnia and I discovered how horrible it is and how it <clears throat> makes feel really bad. So I decided to really fix this problem. And I started to explore what science said <clears throat> and what alternative approaches said. And so I trained in the CBT, which is the main uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the main uh, you know, medical approach and psychiatric approach to uh, insomnia. And um, But I also had already studied yoga nidra, mindfulness meditation, and so on. And um, so uh, I, what, what I really decided to do was to combine uh, an understanding of, of sleep science and the techniques that they use with alternative approaches as well. So taking an integrative approach. The thing about the science is that it's really well established. There isn't a lot of dispute around it as in many topics. You know, they, people agree about, about the science of sleep. <clears throat> and cognitive behavioral therapy has a 70% success rate, which is really high for dealing with a particular problem. And yet it has certain features in it, which a lot of people don't like, which we might come to later. Now, alternative approaches also have many enthusiasts. If you, if you speak to somebody who's into yoga nidra or hypnotherapy or sophrology, which is another system that I've studied, uh, they're really enthusiastic about it. It just doesn't have the science behind it because the science is very expensive, takes a lot of time, so they haven't been done. So I thought, why don't we take the best from both approaches and put them together as one. So that's what I've done. Uh, and I, I began an, an online sleep clinic. Lots of people went, have been through the program. It's available as an online program uh, today as well. And um, it was really successful. And out of that, the book grew, you know. And then the final kind of piece of the jigsaw in this particular approach that I take arose out of the last three years where I had been invited to work in psychedelic psychotherapy, initially with a group of clients who had been on a clinical trial uh, taking psilocybin for um, treatment-resistant depression with tremendously positive effects. 
and I was in the team that helped them with the integration process and the therapy process afterwards. And there's a particular way of working in psychedelic therapy, which is very simple, which is, which is you apply this simple formula of set, setting, and medicine. The set is how you think and feel about things, very important in any endeavor, really. Setting is how you set you know, the bedroom up, the, you know, the body with the vitamins and the, you know, the setting. And then you've got, well, what do you actually take? Now, you can take medicine literally with sleeping pills, but, you know, it's really not good to use them long term problems with habituation and, you know, all sorts of things. Um, so so you, you want to apply another approach. And so I identified 13 ways to get to sleep. And that's the step five in my six step program that I introduced in the book, 13 different ways to get to sleep. And the idea is you try them out and you, you'll find your favorite and work with that. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, so can you tell us about any of those steps, um, how to get to sleep? How to get I know, to sleep. I mean, people should probably read your book, but is there anything yeah. that you can share that's an easy trick? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've jumped right in because, in fact, I say in that chapter, step five, which is choose your medicine, I say, you know, here's the juicy bit. Like, how do I actually get to sleep? You know, if, you, if you've jumped here, Please go back and, and read the other the other four steps because that'll prepare that'll prepare the ground. But assuming that you've prepared the ground and you know you, you're getting the right amount of vitamins and supplements and you're you know you've got the right kind of bedroom and you've calculated the best bedtime and the routine you've got established all those kind of things and how are you actually going to nod off? So you've got a, a relaxed mind, you know, and a car uh, and a, a calm mind and a relaxed body. You're ready to go. Well. Uh, you're gonna. I'll, I'll give you a few, but well, you asked me for one. I'll give you one. Uh, okay, right. which is sophrology, which is a system developed by a Colombian neuropsychiatrist sixty years ago. He died a few years ago now. Um, hugely successful in the French-speaking world. It's never really spread. It, uh, you know, there are books. I've, I've I've written a book about it in English. I'm I'm lucky because I speak and, and read French, so I could study it. You can study it in in English in English. Um, but it's never really crossed the language barrier. But if you go, to, if you go to France, any little town in France will have the sophrologist, and you'll be sitting around the kitchen table, and you'll say, you know, my my daughter's taking her driving test, and she's really anxious about that. Oh, why don't you see Dominique? She's the sophrologist in the town. Oh yes, I'll go there. You know, my husband's having nightmares uh, regularly. Oh, why don't you go and see Dominique? You know, and so on. So sophrology is is highly successful, and it's basically a, a method of Kind of embodied mindfulness with breath, movement, affirmations, um, visualizations, and so on in a kind of sequenced format that helps with this thing. And it can help with going to sleep. And so I present that's one of the techniques I present in the book. So, but there's many different things with that sophrology. So, the mm. visualization or, you know, doing different things that brings the physiological response to a more calming state. So do they do several different things? So do they just pick one of them, like a vision of a garden or floating on a cloud? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no it's very, it's very specific. It, what, what um, this uh, professor Alfonso Caicedo, uh, who developed sophrology, uh, created was a very elegant system, which, which essentially uses tension and relaxation of the muscles. And you the, all the exercises just last 10 minutes. So in our kind of fast paced society, that's great. Oh, thank heavens, just 10 minutes, that's great. And it involves standing up and sitting down and you think, well, this is really strange. But, but, but basically put very simply, you stand up, you breathe in deeply. This is the kind of induction technique. And you hold your breath and you tense, try to tense every muscle in the body as long as you can. <sighs> then you let it out and you release, relax and let go. And you breathe out there. You do that three times with your eyes closed and then you sit down. And what's happened is you've dropped from a sort of beta everyday, normal waking consciousness, beta brainwave state. You drop into an alpha brainwave state, relaxed, much more relaxed. So you've done this little routine that's taken like three minutes, something like that, of tension, release, breathing, standing up. You sit down and you're calm. And then with this particular technique, you go into a visualization where you imagine it's the evening. 
and you're brushing your teeth and getting into bed and you just see yourself going to sleep and having a, and then you do a kind of speeded up film of yourself sleeping deeply and beautifully. You just take a few minutes of this and then you sense yourself waking up in the morning all fresh like that. You then have an affirmation at the end of that. You come out of the exercise 10 minutes a day and you do this during the day, not in the evening. Just do this a few times. And I suggest people do it for a week, just 10 minutes. And I mean, there's more to it than that. I'm giving you the whistle stop tour of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So you, you, do, you do this 10 minutes a day. And what you're doing is you're programming your nervous system. It's this wonderful quality called neuroplasticity, you know, where our nervous systems are actually grow. I mean, physically, literally, that's the amazing thing with neuroplasticity. So your nervous system gets kind of programmed. And there's this other pathway that you're laying down. And you're laying it down in the alpha state very relaxed day. So if you've been used to tossing and turning at night, not getting to sleep and worrying and all the rest of it, what you're doing is you're laying a different pathway. So in the end, when you actually start to act out this fantasy or this visualization, you went, that evening you're going to act it out and so on. I mean, I managed to cure myself of a kind of swimming phobia that I had from falling in a pond when I was a little child. Um, you know, with, with just doing this a few times, but visualizing swimming and loving it and enjoying it. And, and now, I sw now I love swimming. I wish I'd done it earlier when I was younger. I mean, it is pretty amazing because just by thinking or imagining uh, a different state or being in a different state or doing something different, we create these new pathways. I mean, it's amazing. It is amazing, isn't it? It's lovely. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. So... Um, what about if people wake up in the middle of the night? What if they, you know, sometimes you have patients, they say, I sleep four hours, then I wake up and then I'm awake. And then I fall asleep when it's getting light outside, right? Yeah. And you tell them, try all these different supplements, blah, 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 right? But this is a, a much better solution because they don't have to, well, they can just tr retrain themselves. They can retrain themselves. And the thing about, you know, with, with people with, with that problem, which is called in sort of medical terms, they call it um, sleep maintenance, uh, um, you know, disturbance or insomnia, um, that you can't maintain a full night. The first thing for, for people to get is that this is there's nothing wrong with them. This isn't abnormal. That there's a lot of evidence now that we slept in two chunks of about four hours with a couple of hours in between. And the reason we think that is because if you put people down in caves with no cues as to daylight, they will tend to sleep in two chunks, about two hours apart for about four hours. And then the people have gone through old medical records and you know historical records and so on. So there's a suggestion that this is actually, from an evolutionary point of view, the way our ancestors used to sleep. So, so if you accept the fact that, okay, then maybe I'm just kind of more in tune with my ancestral kind of, you know, wisdom than, than you are because you sleep for a whole night, you know, uh, you, you get rid of all this kind of stigma and, 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 and worry around the fact that there's something wrong with you. you. say, oh, this is just completely natural, normal. Then it becomes a life, a lifestyle question. It's like, can you arrange your life around this phenomenon, you know? And 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 the and the various things that prevent people doing doing that, you know, one of them is you know because they have to get up really early to go to work, and you know that's an issue to look at. The other thing is we like to go to sleep with our partners, you know, and it's it's very possible. There's been some interesting research that shows that people who are larks tend to hook up with people who are owls, you know. So the people who you know it's good for them to go to bed early, hook up with people who's good to go to bed late. And again, there may be an evolutionary reason for that, you know, because in childcare, that makes a lot of sense. You're kind of covering more hours uh, for childcare. Um, but it means that often what will happen in a couple is one of you will compromise, you know, because it's nice to go to bed together, you know, when you, when you hook up with somebody. Um, so it's, it's a lifestyle adjustment to make if you suffer from, um, you know, maintenance insomnia, as it's called. Um, but then the question is, okay, I get it. That's that's great. But what do I do when I wake up at, at two in the morning, four in the morning? <clears throat> what do I do? Well, you've got the reason I've called the book The Gift of the Night is that people who have difficulty sleeping, it's very easy for them to see the night as a kind of enemy. It's like, oh my God, I've got another night where I'm going to toss and turn and worry. And then when I worry, I start worrying about worry because I know the worry isn't good for me. So I worry about the fact that I'm worrying. And so you're kind of double worrying and not sleeping. 
So, so the night isn't your friend. So this, the suggestion here, right from the beginning of the book, is turn this around and see the night as your friend and see this as a gift of, of me time. You know the way we're always going around saying, I don't have enough time for me. I'm, I'm looking after the kids during the day and there's my husband who's so demanding and uh, you know, the work and all the rest of it. But like actually eight hours a day, every 24 hours, we're given this kind of retreat, retreat time. It's all yours. Just, you know, relax. <laughs> so, so, so you treat it as a gift. So you say, okay, what am I going to do for these two hours? And there's like a whole lot of things you could do. You could, you could make up a playlist of you know composers that you don't know. I did this when I suffered from my bout of insomnia. I never have time to listen to music when when during the day. And I wanted there were these composers that people told me about. You know, beautiful music, and I'd never had a chance to listen to it. So I made up playlists of all this wonderful sacred music and Bach and John Taverner and all the rest of it, and listened to it. And then meditation techniques. It's like, oh, why don't I, for, for the whole month, I'll kind of list, do some kind of mantra meditation. Let me try that. And, you, you know, yoga nidra or whatever. Or you, maybe you want to learn a language. Or maybe you actually want to get up and write a bit of your book or do some housework or whatever it is. You just accept that this yeah. is your body's natural flow. And, and um, so that's, that's, that's the idea behind it. Uh, you know, and, and that... Yeah, and people can take a, a class and learn more about this online yeah they can they can do two things they can they can either um they can they can go online i have a i have a online class called the sleep clinic and um and 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 that's a series of and it, and it's uh, pre-recorded so so you you just take it at your own pace and it's got 14 different recording audios on it and so on and it just takes you through and, and people say they found it extremely helpful um uh, and then there's also the book, the the gift of the night, which mm -hmm. has just come out. And of course, on the audio record, uh, on the audio or audio book version of the gift of the night, there's there's a bunch of scripts. I've get, I give five scripts out of these thirteen methods that I that I've identified. Five of them I I read out in a very soporific voice. So, <laughs> so the audio book acts as a kind of sleep aid as well. Hopefully, right. <laughs> That's great. You yeah. also talked about uh, the importance of, you know, how your bedroom looks. Uh, can you just mention why that would be important? Okay. Imagine imagine you come around to, to visit me and, and I take you into our house and I say, you know, Lottie, I've got a room dedicated to changing consciousness in this house. And you might say, oh, wow, that's like a whole room for changing consciousness. I said, yeah, it's dedicated to that. And you wonder what it is. I'm going to show you some kind of temple or some sort of meditation. <laughs> Or right. And I open the door and it's the bedroom. Because what do you do in a bedroom? You change consciousness. You lie there and then you go into a very altered state of consciousness and then you come back again, ideally. So, so, so that's so if you see the bedroom as your as your ashram, as your temple, as your retreat space, um, however you want to term it, and you basically do what you know, what sleep science and doctors call sleep hygiene, which I think is a very unfortunate term. I mean, if you go, you know, if you go to a doctor and talk about your sleep, he'll teach you sleep hygiene, which immediately suggests that somehow you, you're being unhygienic in how you sleep, <laughs> which I think is insulting, you know. Yeah, and and so I much prefer set and setting, talking about the setting, you know, what's setting, what's your bedroom like? You know? And you'd be amazed at the at the the settings. I've had people in my my sleep clinic who will will say, well, yeah, you know, I have, um, you know, my husband moved out, so, and I've got a double bed, and so I've got some of the furniture from, you know, the move I've got, I've, you know, I've got a coffee table on the bed, but that's okay, I can fit on the other side of the bed, and I do have six, um, six cats who sleep with me, you know, mm -hmm. but I can't, I don't sleep very well. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> encourage people to, you know, to treat, make their bedroom a beautiful place where they change consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember my dad when I was a little, you know, especially when I hit teenage years and you're trying to rebel as much as you can. And he was mm. a physician. And so to encourage me to make my bed, because I was in my rebellious state, he would always say, well, you know, when that bed is made, it's a lot more inviting to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's still, you know, it's still with me today. It's like, no, you, you wake up, you make your bed, you make your bedroom look nice because you want it to be inviting at the end of the day. Yeah, but, absolutely. But it is. I, I I completely hear you. It's so important, and I think people don't realize how important it is, you know, to 
you want to walk into that bedroom and feel like this is my sanctuary. This is this is my sanctuary. This is where I'm going to go to sleep, and you know, and then there are all sorts of like details around temperature and and you know ventilation, and it's amazing. For instance, men and women have different basal metabolic rates. You know, so they, you know, men to men tend to feel hotter in bed than women, but then you know the menopause it might reverse and so on, and so you know there's a very simple solution to that around around just having two single duvets of different thicknesses that you put in the same duvet cover. You know, so that so that each person, you know, whereas often in a couple situation, it's amazing how many couples one person puts up with being too hot or too cold because of their partner, you know, yeah. fix these things, you know, so it's mm -hmm. just tells like that, you know. Mm -hmm. What about um, couples that have a partner that snores or ah. you know, that keep so it keeps waking them up? So. What that's a huge yeah that's a huge issue they've, they've done a survey and i've forgotten what it is but it's something like it, it's i may have got this statistic wrong because i always forget stats you know but it's something like 20 percent of couples in america sleep apart because of snoring mm -hmm. and um in fact one of the things you know if i if i do a workshop on 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 sleep uh and and i go around the circle asking people for their story you know just talk to me about your sleep and what it's like and all the rest of it and you know you'll do one round, and the the people who don't have a problem, you know, there'll be some people who say I don't have a problem, you know. Right. Second round, when they've loosened up and heard everybody's stories, they'll say, well, actually, you know, my partner snores terribly, and I, you know, I I, I, I wake up and I think about wandering into the spare room and see, and I never know what what to do and all that. So it's huge. Uh, luckily, there's there's a whole bunch of things you can do, and 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 um, you know, I go into it in the in the book, and I go into it in the sleep clinic. There are lots of different resources that you can turn to, but very simply, you need to identify whether it's coming from a problem with the nose, the mouth, or the you know the the throat, basically the tongue and throat, and then you kind of home in on those and you apply uh, you know what's been found and you know the, the the devices that you can buy and the techniques you can use and so on. But they can be you shouldn't you shouldn't have to put up with it. You know you can you can fix it. And if you can't fix it, then you have, you know, you have, then I suggest, you know, there's this interesting thing about, you know, you, you have this, you, you have this discussion about, you know, whether you should, maybe you should sleep apart, mm -hmm. you know, but then what do you do about the intimacy? Because part of being in a couple is, is the, the, the intimacy. And then, you know, do you make dates with each other for intimacy, which some people find a wonderful turn on, you know, and other people find a complete turn off because they can't switch themselves on on a Monday night or whatever, you know, just like that. You know, uh, so so there's, it's a very interesting area, and one of the great things I love about sleep mm -hmm. is is um, a, a friend of mine who's a doctor in Glasgow said that he had developed this acronym which is SAFE S A F E, and he said he'd found with patients that a great way to begin a, a, a dialogue with them or relate start off with talking about sleep. Then you can get onto alcohol, then food, then exercise. Mm -hmm. If you go straight in with, you know, how much do you eat? You know, are you eating too much? Or you, how much are you drinking? Mm -hmm. People immediately throw up defenses. But starting off by talking about sleep, it's easy. You know, how does your sleep? And people, for some reason, they find it easier to talk about the fact that they have problems around sleep and difficulties. And that's a way in, a safe way in to start a discussion around health in, 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 in general. So, so um, that's another reason I like this topic, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a, everybody sleeps, so it's a really important yeah. topic, and and yeah. so many people don't get good sleep, right? Like, yeah, about about so a third of the a third of the adult population, if not more, have report sleep difficulties. Yeah. Now I know you work a lot with magic, uh, druidry. How does all of that fit into sleep and everything else that you do? Ah, uh, exactly. Okay. Well, I was I was incredibly lucky when I was eleven years old. My dad, we lived in London. My dad introduced me to the old chief druid. He was a lovely guy who, who was like a kind of uncle figure, family friend in the household. And he ran a druid order, a druid group in London. They did ceremonies on Parliament Hill in London and so on. And I became absolutely fascinated by that. And it was, you know, I grew up at the time, you know, the swinging 60s and into the 70s in London. So it was, you know, London suddenly became Technicolor. It was black and white until about 1960. And then they switched on the color and it was all wonderful. And then lots of gurus came over from India. And there was a fascinating, and I was fascinated by that as well. And I was fascinated by Buddhism and the, the Maharishi and so on. But the idea that in, in Britain, we had all these stone circles and magical sites, 
and that there was this ancient pre-Christian spiritual tradition of the Druids just fascinated me. And I happened to know, you know, somebody. So from the age of 16, I started to train with him. And I was initiated on Glastonbury tour when I was 18. And then uh, in my 30s, I was asked to lead a Druid group. And I found myself traveling all over the world in the end. I'm into the States a lot and Australia and New Zealand and so on, teaching Druidry. And, you know, and we use guided meditations. And I would notice a phenomenon, which is sometimes people would say, wow, I fell asleep during your meditation, but I feel great now, or, you know, or whatever. And, and, and I started to become interested in how the voice can be used to guide people into sleep and out of sleep like that. So because I was trained in psychology and psychotherapy as well, that kind of my interest, uh, you know, fed into that as well and so and so i started to see how how can one use the voice and the techniques of meditation to actually help people to go to sleep and so i recorded uh, a cd uh you remember those days in the past when people had cds <laughs> yes. right. and, uh, it, it's now available on you know amazon and itunes and all that um called sacred nature and 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 in that I, I I made a couple of tracks on sleep. I did one called um, uh, Healing Sleep, and another one called Drawing from the Well, which was a cat nap recording. And after a few months, I looked on Amazon. You know the way you do. You look and you had a look at the reviews, and there was a lady on there saying, "I have used this recording eight hundred times, and I've never got to the end of it. I you know uh, I used to think I was an insomniac, and I'm not anymore. You know." So I thought, well, this is, you know, so this was another reason why I got into sleep therapy is I thought here, this is interesting. You know, I want to, I want to do more of this. I want to help more people and, and explore this in more detail. Right. Um, so when you're, when you're working as a Druid, what, can you explain what a Druid is or what, what that entails? What is that? Is that like a shamanism or what is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, Druidry is, is the way you describe it would be as an earth spirituality or nature spirituality. It's where um, you, you, it has three schools in it, three kind of streams of teaching. It's all one and they all kind of weave together, but there's a way in which that these three streams and one is, is the Bardic school. That's where you start. If you train in Druidry and we've, we've developed, a, you know, we have an online training, you know, everything's taught online now, isn't it? Including Druidry. You can, you can go onto our website, druidry.org, and in, it's in seven languages, you know, and we have trainings in it, you know. So, 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 um, so but in, in this training, you, you start off with the Bardic school and it's all about st storytelling. So it's, it's, it's this, idea that psychologists and psychotherapists understand very much about the power of narrative you know understanding your story and then the collective stories of your of your of, of where you live the folklore and all the rest of it your ancestral stories stories of your family all these help you hugely to to find your place in the world you know and and so you 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 learn the art of bardism but it's also the kind of artistic expression creativity how does creativity flow through me and all the rest of it? And then you move on to the more shamanic uh, school, if you like, which is called the Ovates, which work with the power of trees and of plants, the healing energies of nature, and the kind of elastic quality that time has when you start to learn how to explore the other world and past and present and future all start to be a little less defined than you thought they were and and you dive in and discover all sorts of wonders and so on so that's the that's the the ovate work and then and then you come to the druid uh work itself which is philosophy and ritual you know conducting ceremonies and um uh weddings and funerals and baby blessings and seasonal ceremonies and so on so it's that kind of stuff. Fascinating. Um, so you're talking about the nature, uh, the ovates work and how that works with nature. When you look at trees and, and flowers or go to the woods, would you say that, you know, you resonate with the plants and the tree or that they're alive, that we have a connection with them, that they're not really separate from us? Or how, how do you look at that? 
Absolutely, that that's exactly it. I mean, you know, from a sort of uh, psychological angle, more and more people nowadays are talking about connection and connectedness as a way of healing. Because what we've done is we've created a kind of world for many of us that's so disconnected from nature, you know. I have a friend who was renting a high-rise apartment in London the other day, and I went to this kind of glistening glass and concrete tower in London. And, you know, we went out to a restaurant, we had a great time and all the rest of it. But it was so unnatural. It was like living in the future in some way. Um, but but some people live like that all the time. Uh, I, I kind of tend to forget that because I live in a lovely garden surrounded by trees, you know, in, in the country. And, and so I forget this but but a lot of us live in this disconnected world and part of the healing i think that we need to go through individually and collectively is is weaving ourselves back into the fabric of nature and realizing there isn't a separation and so what druidry does is it helps us to feel connected to the earth and the trees and the plants and the sky that we're all that we're all in this together you know and uh, yeah, that's one of the main aims of Druidry, you know, mm -hmm. which is why it's seeing such a huge revival. It's amazing the amount of people involved in it now. Yeah. So for people who are listening um, and would like to go and learn more about that and how do I connect to nature? Uh, do you have any recommendations for those people what to do and how to how to begin that journey? Well, of course, I'm biased. I believe that the what we offer is, is is the best way to do it. And I would suggest that people go to druidry.org, which mm -hmm. is druid and then ry.org. And you'll see there's lots of information on that website. And, you know, if you sort of browse around a little bit, if you like the feel of it, if you click on the join thing, you come to a page which has a little message, uh, a little video message and 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 and, you know, you the, and there's this training that we've developed over the last 35 years which is kind of uh, immersive and experiential and um, yeah. And it works with some films and some music and some meditations and teachings and so on. And it, it takes you by the hand, you know, and, and, and suggests ways of working so that you gradually develop your creativity and your, you know, deepening sense of connection with nature and so on. Yeah. And you talked uh, about the importance of the, the storytelling and, and sharing and, the ancestral stories. Mm. So the way in our modern world, we have this illusion that we're separate from every everybody else or our ancestors until you yeah. start working with it. And then you realize how much the ancestors have an influence on mm. who we are and what we do. Um, so how do you, what do you see in Druidry? How can that help people? Or is it more sharing what the ancestors did or their stories what what they did wrong what they did right and how does that then influence the people today why is it important for them to know about the ancestors yeah absolutely and of course we're coming up to this time of Samhain, you know halloween the time of the ancestors towards the end of october uh, uh and in druidry we have we have these eight festivals you know the solstices the equinoxes and the and festivals in between and we're coming up to this time where we think of the ancestors and we connect with them and so on people we love who've passed on to the other world and so on um so so the 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 we work when 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 we go into the ovate school we work specifically with the ancestors and we do that in a very personal way by by in, encouraging people to explore their family tree in you know, the classic thing that we do with ancestry.com and so on, you know, Dingen test, exploring your ancestry, but, 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 but always bearing in mind that there's a beautiful concept in Druidry, which is the milk line as well as the bloodline. So rather than just thinking about your family, I mean, there are some people who don't know who their, who their, uh, their, their, their ancestors are, uh, you know, they're adopted or whatever. Um, there are some people who don't like who their ancestors were. They had very difficult relationships with their parents and so on. Um, and the reality is that there are people in our past and the past of our family who were very influential, who weren't genetically related to us often. These can be spiritual teachers. They can be, um, you know, people who really nurtured us when we were young. You know, so this is the idea of the milk line. In, in the Celtic world in the past, there were a lot of wet nurses, a lot of uh, women who would, you know, feed babies and, and, and so on. And so the milk, this is where the, the idea of the milk line comes. And um, 
the so milk, so we encourage milk line like milk like baby milk like nursing like baby milk yeah that's yeah, right yeah milk the milk line. okay yeah interesting so so we encourage people to think of their milk line like who are the people who were really formative in your life and who nurtured you and kind of made you who you are today you know mm -hmm. so you have not only genetic ancestors of blood line and blood connection but the milk line as well and and then you and then you um this helps you in a, in a number of ways one to kind of fill out your story so you kind of understand more of who you are where you've come from your your part in the the bigger story of humanity and uh and at the same time and, and it brings a kind of depth and color to your sense of identity right? mm -hmm. uh, and and it and it brings compassion too because you often discover that not all of your ancestors were that great and 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 so you know we realize you know that uh you, you, you know that we need to have compassion towards you know them towards us towards others and and it's it's part of kind of becoming human becoming more human i think you know and and we develop this sense of community because you know one of the great findings that you know psychology is coming around to now is that we we've disconnected ourselves from nature so we need to kind of rebuild that sense of connection which was never broken it was broken in our consciousness it's so, always oh, i mean we're part of nature so it can't be broken you know so we just have to remember that but then there's community as well the other thing that's happened is we've got isolated from each other and and so how do you build community and part of building communities getting to know who you are and your ancestors and what your what your connections are literally you know mm -hmm. um and then the third level of, of of healing and connectedness comes to a connection to a sense of meaning or spirituality mm -hmm. lots of studies show that that having a spiritual understanding is good for mental well-being having a spiritual perspective i should say is good for mental well-being because it gives your life some sense of purpose and meaning yeah absolutely it's the, the modern world um i think a lot of diseases also come from being disconnected being disconnected from nature being disconnected from any kind of support um whether it's family or friends uh because mm. people get so isolated and then i, f I feel like the body also falls apart with that right mm. so, so yeah. important yeah um so of all the books that you've written do you have a favorite or do you have a couple of favorites oh oh um I tried. I'm sorry if you can hear my grand grandson <laughs> teething teething at the moment, and I can no. hear him. Maybe oh, I, no, it's, it's not picking up on my end. But... Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, favorite. Oh, that's that's really hard. I'm not sure at the moment. The gift of the night is my favorite mm -hmm. because uh, it's so kind of practical, and people who've read it uh, mm -hmm. say it has this immediate effect. So there's a very sort of heartwarming feeling that. You know, this little book can really help people and make a big shift in their lives. Um, I'm kind of fond of the novel. I've written one novel. Uh, all of my books are nonfiction, but I've written one work of fiction called The Prophecies, um, uh, which you know took about five years to write. So, I've, uh, so I'm kind of very fond of that and the story in it. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit what that book is about? Ah, uh, it's. I was. I was. I had written a book called The Book of English Magic with a mm -hmm. co-author. And at the, at the launch of it uh, in London, the publisher said to me, you know, we really like it. You should, we'd like you to work on some fiction. We think you could write fiction. Mm -hmm. And my initial kind of knee-jerk reaction was, no, I, I, you know, I can't write fiction. I only write nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And then during the summer, you know, on holiday, I was thinking, why did I say that? I mean, like, why not? And wouldn't that be fun? It would be kind of interesting to play with that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the question came, well, what are you going to write? If you're going to write fiction, what is it? And I was staying at the time in this extraordinary house that was, you know, it almost felt like it was haunted. It was ancient and it was very atmospheric. And a woman, it was in the forest in Brittany in France. And the woman who lived there was called the Druidess of Brocéliande. And she was a famous prophet and seer. And so I decided, and I'm sleeping in her bedroom. You know, she had died in 1960 or something. And it was, you know, uh, it was a bed and breakfast place. You know, so I was, I was sleeping in, in this four poster bed that was her bed. And um, I, I started to research her life. And I asked the owner 
um, you know, do you know anything about her life? Because it sounds so extraordinary. And he said, um, I don't, but I know a man who does. I must, uh, and he arranged for me to go and see a count, a comte, de, 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 I forgot the name now, Grenouillac or something like that. And we, and he drove me to his chateau. And, and, and it was 11 o'clock in the morning. And I remember the, the count and countess handing me a glass of whiskey. And I tried to politely refuse. And they said, no, 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 drink it. So I drank it. And he showed me around the chateau. And then I, I popped the question to him. I said, you know, can you tell me about the druidess of Brasilia? He then told me a story from her life that was so extraordinary. I couldn't get it out of my head. I mean, I just had to write the book. I just, it was, you know, it was just crying out to be told. If I told you the story now, you know, if I told you this, you know, you would spoil it because it's that, right, that's right. how the book. Well, I'm going to have to read uh, it. But, yeah. <laughs> so that was the story. So it's actually based on the truth. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a work of fiction, but it's a fictionalized story um, mm -hmm. that, that has lots of true elements in it. Oh, it sounds very exciting. <laughs> I can't wait to read that one. <laughs> and then um, the other book, uh, Seek Teachings Everywhere. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Okay. Well, that's the thing about Druidry is it sounds very, when you first hear about it, you know, the Druid tradition, it, it sounds very specific, doesn't it? It sounds very particular. Oh, you know, that's the pre-Christian kind of magical tradition, both, you know, in the British Isles and, and, and Brittany and, and Ireland, you know. Uh, but actually, Druidry, as it's developed in the contemporary world, is is highly combinable you know there's that word i never know how to pronounce it Mi miscible m-i-s-c-i-b-l-e miscible mm -hmm. it's like if you're making cocktails uh vodka is a great base because it can you can mix anything with vodka for instance mm -hmm. so, so druidry is a bit like the vodka you can mix it with you can mix it with wicca you can mix it with buddhism jainism uh christianity you know and it goes really well together so so i over the last 30 years i've written various essays and studies on druidry and christianity because a number of christians are druids as well and um you know there and, and and so i've written about that and then i've studied the jain tradition which is kind of earlier than buddhism mm -hmm. and some people say earlier than hinduism in in india very interesting dharmic religion i've i've studied that for about 12 years and i've that combines very well with druidry and i've studied wicca as well and so so the collections of essays that introduce this idea of combinations mm -hmm. and and then and then there's a section on druidry and wicca druidry christianity druidry and jainism and you know suggestions of how you might like to look at it works very well with Taoism as well, for instance. Um, so that's that's the book. Um, Another great and, one. And... <laughs> you don't have to read that one too. <laughs> so I'm just going to work my way backwards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got to do the sleep one too. The gift of the yeah. night, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, fa it's just fascinating, especially as you know, so many people have sleep issues. Yeah, it's exactly. Such a, it's such a common uh, issue, the insomnia. I can't go to sleep and they worry. So, well, well, I think, you know, the point is that, you know, we, you know, there, there's basically sleep, nutrition and exercise are these kind of cornerstones that we need for a healthy physical body and mental, you know, life, uh, mental well-being. And, you know, we've all heard that, heard those stories about how doctors up until recently you know, in their sort of years of medical training, would just get like one hour on nutrition or one right. afternoon on you know, whole training or something like that. You know, that's being fixed. People are people are really you know you can find a lot on nutrition and in, in, in now in relation to health, exercise and a lot on exercise. You know how it affects health. Mm -hmm. That third pillar, you know, is less less developed, and we need to develop that. So, so I I like working with psychology with psychotherapists because if you're a psychotherapist. You know, one of the first questions you should ask your client in your initial exploratory mm -hmm. uh, discussions is, you know, how's your sleep? Mm -hmm. Because because there's this incredible relationship between mental well-being and sleep. Mm -hmm. And if you, there are some psychotherapists who will admit that they have never talked about their client's sleep, yeah, even though they've been working with them for years. And you say, mm -hmm. come on, you know, you need to look at that because sometimes you can in, help somebody's mental health massively in two or three sessions if you get their sleep fixed yeah 
absolutely. I'm right there. Every time, I mean, I'm a naturopathic physician, so we're trained differently and we do get a lot of nutrition, but that I mean, there's some standard questions, yeah. right? And it's always, what is your sleep like? What is your stress level like? And do you have a bowel movement every day? I mean, once yeah. you can make them go to the bathroom and sleep yeah. and reduce the stress, then we're now we're on course to, to on create course healing. For, for better right? health. Yeah. They're such important. They're cornerstones of your health. That's you know, if you're mm. not sleeping well, everything else is gonna go out the window. So it's go out of whack. Important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so important. Um so do you have, it's been such a, an honor to have you as a guest today, but I know we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, is there yeah. any last uh, messages of advice that you would want to give the world? The world is such a, a messy place right now. Is there any yeah. advice that you can give to people that will help them create a uh, common peace in their own life? Yeah, I would say I'm I'm amazed at the the, the 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 amount of people who will experience sleep difficulties. And of course, we've talked about insomnia, but we haven't talked about the other kind of related ones, like the relationship between sleep and depression, sleep and obesity, uh, you know, sleep walking, sleep talking, you know, sleep phobia. There are lots of other things as well, which which I deal with in the book. And it's amazing how many people are resigned to their sleep difficulty. They will say, oh, I've, you know, I've had insomnia for years now. There's nothing. I've tried everything. You know, my husband snores. We've tried everything. Keeps me awake every night, but we've tried everything. You know, well, um, I, 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 my suggestion would be you really can fix this. You could, you, or I should say you probably can fix this. There's a very high likelihood. You just have to take a little bit of effort to do it, but it would change your life. You'll feel so much better that it's really worth, you know, take it, making the effort and, and trying to fix it. Because you'll feel calmer and more peaceful for a start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, can you let everybody know what your website is and how they can learn more about you and, and also how to find your books? Okay, sure. Yeah. So it's just my name. And the, the advantage of my name is it's weird. And there's only one of me, which so that's really helpful. So so my name is Philip with one L and then Cargom, which is C A double -R, R hyphen G O double M. So, so if you if you if you just Google me, uh, you'll find me, uh, Philip Cargom. You know, my website is philipcargom.com. That's Philip Cargom with a, with a little dash, dot com. And you'll see all my books there under courses. You go into courses, and you'll see the Sleep Clinic online and other courses in magic, lessons in in magic, and so on, and the Druidry stuff. You'll see it all there and on on philipcargom.com. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. And we'll make sure to put your website in the podcast notes as well. So you can just go to the notes great. and click on the link and it will take you right to Philip's website. So it's been such an honor to have you as a guest today. So thank you so much for taking the time and, and sharing all your knowledge with the listeners. And so it's a pleasure, Lottie. Thank you. So well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. As we conclude this episode, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude for your presence within our community. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share this podcast with friends and family. Subscribe to my newsletter in the show notes and receive new podcast episodes delivered right to your inbox. If you resonate with the interconnectedness of mind, body, and soul, and are motivated to embark on a journey of personal healing, I invite you to connect with me at drlaudie.com. Together, we can pave a path towards transformative healing in your own life.